It's when I hear a voice whisper through the noise that brings a bigger picture into view. Whenever the clouds come into my mind, I won't forget it's you who tells the sun to shine. Every birthday, every night, every second thought about tomorrow's wasting time. One time, break it down two times. Hey, listen up. Why should I worry? Why should I care? Cause nobody loves me, no. Like you love me. Why should I worry? No. Why should I care? Every second part of about tomorrow's time. We don't want to see anybody standing all the way in the far back. That's too far back. Come up. Oh, everybody, it's Friday, Chapel. It's Friday. We are so glad that you are here. Let's stand. Let's worship the Lord. One of my favorite places in Din the Chapel is a plaque in the back where it says, and all in the temple said glory. Can you guys say glory? Can you say glory? All right. Sing, sing praise to God. Sing praise to God who reigns above the God of all creation. The God of power, the God of love, the God of our salvation. He fills my soul with sweet relief and makes my faithless murmur cease. The God of praise and glory, the God. Peace and joy and blessing, and in my Father's tender care, His love is. spirit raises my heart revived my soul restored my heart rejoices
Let all who claim Christ's holy name give God all praise and glory. Let all who lean on the Spirit's strength declare the wondrous story. Cast every idol from its throne, for Christ is Lord. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we give you all of the glory this morning. Thank you for already the amazing first week that we've had. Lord, and we just look forward to worshiping with you all this semester in Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen. Amen. You may be seated, my friends. Happy Friday once again. Woo, you got through the first four days. Everyone inhale. Exhale. Feel the feels we got here on Friday. So good to see you. A couple quick notices as we launch into this weekend. It's a busy athletic weekend, is it not? We've got men's and women's soccer tonight. I think our cross country is traveling. Big opening football game tomorrow night. There's lots of things going on. Volleyball's traveling. There's just lots of good things around campus that are happening. One of those things tonight at 9.30 is the Pillar Campus Ministry Root Beer Kager that will be on the lawn. Yeah, get your dance, get the moving, get the feels going tonight. Yes. Sunday night, we've got the gathering at 8 o'clock in here. And, uh, and I'm going to open up a series. I want to invite you out. What anchors, our, what anchors our ministry is word and table. And we want to invite you to come receive uh, Christ at the gathering. So come here at 8 o'clock. It's going to be a beautiful night. Uh, also, a couple notices. If you are interested in getting involved in a Bible study, you can uh, get on our website. You can come to the Campus Ministry House. We would love to get you involved in a small group where you're making friends, you're learning the scriptures, you're growing deeper with God. And then finally, next Friday, next Friday, we've got the Men's and Women's Night Out out at Camp Geneva. We want to invite you all to be coming out. We'll have some more information about that coming out to you soon. But uh, Sign-ups are available through our website. All right, those are all of our notices for right now. And now I want to pivot and introduce a man who really needs no introduction. He's the one, he's the only, he's our beloved president, Matt Skogan. Hey. Oh boy, TGIF, it is so good to see you. It is so good to see you. Uh, as Trig said, my name is Matt Skogan. I have the best job in the world. I get to be the president of the best institution in the world. I am starting my fourth year as the president of Hope College. If you, <laughs> if you don't know me, I thought I would briefly introduce uh, myself and my family on the screen. I was here as a student from 1998 to 2002. I graduated, spent 17 years on the East Coast working in government and business, and a few years ago the board invited me to come back and serve this place. Nothing in my life has been a bigger joy than this job. Uh, I want to introduce you to uh, my wife, Sarah. This is Sarah. Uh, you'll see her around. <laughs> Uh, Sarah graduated from Hope the same year I did, 2002. We met our freshman year, fall of 1998. Uh, we started dating our senior year, 
took her a while to figure out how amazing I am. <laughs> uh, she uh, graduated from Hope and got a master's degree in artificial intelligence. She had an extremely successful career in software engineering before we came back to Hope. Uh, she's teaching two courses at Hope this semester. She's teaching a first year seminar on authenticity and identity, and she's teaching a computer science course. So you'll see her around. Uh, these are our three kids. These are our three kids. Uh, Sophie's in the middle. She just started ninth grade last week. This is them on their, actually, this is their second day of school. Sophie's in the middle. She just started ninth grade. Uh, Lucy's on the left. She's in seventh grade. And Oliver, we call him Ollie, is there on the right. He, he's wearing one of his favorite shirts. It's the Hope College Residential Life shirt from last year. He, he keeps saying he wants to take a black Sharpie and write a P in front of residential life so that it says Hope College Presidential Life, <laughs> which would be great. Uh, and then this is our dog, Alby. You'll see him around. He's named after Albertus Van Ralty, who's the founder of Hope. So, so we, are, we are all in. We are all in on this place. Uh, I love this place. I love my job. I love so many things about my job. The thing I love most about my job is spending time with you, getting to know you, our students, and any small role I can play in the journey that God has you on is the biggest source of joy for me. Uh, I love my life because every day is a little different. I'm still learning a lot. I'm still learning how to do this job. I learned one important thing over the last few months, which is to never make a bet with the admissions team. Uh, last year, I, made, uh, I agreed to a challenge with the admissions team, and I agreed to get a Hope tattoo if if they got over a thousand deposits from new students coming to Hope. And at the time, at the time of this challenge, like that seemed completely impossible. Somehow they pulled it off. And so uh, this summer, I did something I've never done before. <laughs> I went to... <laughs> oh this is real. This is real. I went to, we did it in Allendale so it wouldn't become like a press event in Holland. Uh, I went to a tattoo parlor and got a tattoo. Now, a couple of things about this. First of all, uh, lots of conversations with the admissions team. I had a couple of conversations with Patrick Daniel and Danielle Rebert. They both have tattoos. I asked them, I said, is this going to hurt? They said, no, no, it won't hurt. Uh, Danielle said, it'll feel like a kitten tickling you. Now, I thought, that sounds amazing. Like, I want that. <laughs> it did not feel like that. Uh, thankfully, uh, Angelique Gaddy was there. You can see her in the foreground. That's Jiki. She was there to, uh, to comfort me. So I got through it. Uh, for a while, I thought I would be making history as the first Hope president to have a tattoo. But then we did some research over the summer, and we discovered that our third president, uh, who was Garrett Collin, who was president starting in 1893, we, we found this photo of him that very few people have ever seen. Um, <laughs> it, it turns out he was like hiding a lot underneath his sleeves. Like, not only a bunch of Hope tattoos, but incredible biceps. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, l let me just say two uh, sort of half-serious things about this, because some of you are probably thinking this is weird. Uh, I have never worked at a place the name of which I would actually want to get tattooed on myself. Uh, for example, uh, a Wachovia bank tattoo would have been very weird, uh, especially because that bank no longer exists. Uh, the Hope tattoo I have is under my watch band and the letters face me, so that when I'm having one of those days, I can take off my watch and I can read the word hope, and I can remember why I'm here, why I love this place, and what we stand for. <laughs> I, <laughs> you're so nice, because some of you are probably thinking this is like really strange, and uh, some, of you, some of you think this is cool, and thank you for that. Uh, some of you might actually be thinking, this seems very childlike, like our president got a tattoo kind of on this, this whim of a challenge. And actually, that's what I want to talk to you about, not just this morning, but over the course of, I get to speak in chapel five times over the course of the academic year. And I want to talk on one theme, which is being childlike. And here's how I want to set it up. Obviously, one of the points of college is to prepare you for adulthood, and we'll do that. But as you prepare for the world out there, I want to challenge you to not lose your childlike qualities. There's a verse in Mark 10 where Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven belongs, belongs to those who are childlike. And then he goes on and he says, those who receive my words, he says, unless you receive my words like a child, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. 
what he's saying, what he's saying is that in the upside down universe that God creates, in the upside down universe that God creates, there are certain realities, there are certain kingdom realities that you cannot unlock unless you have a childlike perspective. He's saying in the upside down universe that God creates, actually, the more childlike you become, the more wise you become. Now, there's a distinction between, between childlike and childish, and we'll talk about that. Over the course of the next few times I get to be with you in chapel, we'll talk about things like developing a childlike sense of awe and wonder so that we look at the world, even the brokenness of the world, and we say, wow, I wonder how God is going to turn these ashes into beauty. We're going to talk about developing a childlike faith. We're going to talk about developing a childlike prayer life and a childlike sense of worship. But this morning, just to set this up with the rest of my time, I simply want to make the case. I simply want to set this up by making the case that you and I were made. We were made to have a child-parent relationship with the God of the universe. We were made to be children of a loving father. That's why God made everything. Scripture says the point of creation is so that you and I can be in relationship with our loving father. But the problem is we rejected that relationship. And there's a heartbreaking moment in the story of Genesis where God is walking through the garden at sunset and he's looking for Adam and Eve because he wants to enjoy their company. But they're hiding. They're hiding from God. See, we all reach this point in our adolescence when we, like, don't want to be around our parents anymore. And Adam and Eve, in the story of Genesis, reach that point with their loving father, where they basically say, you know, this would be a lot better if God wasn't around. We could do whatever we want if God wasn't around. This God guy is kind of cramping our style, and I wish he would just leave. And at some point in our lives, we've all said the same thing to God. My life would be a lot better if I could do things my way. I wish God would just leave. That means the reason we feel distance between us and God, the reason we don't feel as close to our loving Father as we want to, is because we pushed him away. And that, by the way, is a dramatic departure from every other world religion. Every world religion, every major world religion, agrees on two things. One, there is a God. But two, he's not very close. Every religion agrees there's a God, but there's distance between humanity and God. But all those other religions, you know what they say? They say, you know why that distance exists, right? Because God is mad at us. He's mad at us, and therefore we have to try really hard to live really good lives and please him with our obedience, and then maybe, maybe he will take us back. The Bible says something radically different. The Bible says, yeah, there's distance between us and God, but guess who moved? Yeah, there's distance between us and God, but it's not that God rejected us, it's that we rejected God. Yeah, there's distance between us and God, but it's not that God is disappointed in us, it's that some point along the line in our lives, we decided we're embarrassed of him, and we pushed him away. And the entire story of the Old Testament is the people of God getting bolder and bolder in their desire to push God away. Until in the New Testament, God makes the ultimate move. God comes down from heaven to earth in the person of Jesus. And how do we respond? We kill him. We kill him. God comes to earth, and we say, now's our chance. We can take him out once and for all. But God says, even then, it's okay. I still love you. You can throw all your hate at me, all your disdain at me. You can even kill me, but I can't stop loving you. And Sarah and I, with our kids, we've had these moments, especially when they were little, every once in a while, they would just throw these temper tantrums where they were like, flailing and hitting and screaming and pounding us. And I would just hold them. I would hold them as tight as I could while they're flailing. And I would say, there's nothing you can do to make me stop loving you. And that's us and God. We're flailing and we're trying to push God away. And God is saying, there's nothing you can do to make me stop loving you. You can even kill me, but I'm coming back. I'm coming back because I love you. See, what this means is that God has made the ultimate move to restore the loving relationship that we ought to have with our heavenly Father. The next move is on us. The next move is on us to go back to God and say, we've tried, we've tried to enjoy your creation without you, and it's empty. It's completely meaningless, and so we're going to run back to you. And God is just waiting there. He's just waiting there, eager and ready to take us in. And you might be thinking, that's great for some people, but not me. Not after what I've done. But don't you see? Don't you see that the whole point of the Bible, the whole point of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus is God trying to say to you, I've seen it all. I've seen everything you've done, and at this point, I don't even care anymore. I just want you to come back. See, every healthy child-parent relationship has two qualities. The children know they're completely dependent on their parents in any healthy situation. They know they're completely dependent on their parents. Our kids don't wake up in the morning and think, how do we raise money today so we can get food on the table? 
Sarah and I do that. Our kids are completely reliant on us to give them the necessities of life. And the second thing is, in a healthy relationship, kids know that their parents will accept them regardless of what they've done. Now, I know a lot of you don't have ideal parent relationships, but what I do know is that every one of us has a perfect, loving father who's just waiting, just waiting for us to run back to him. And I've experienced this in earthly relationships. I've gotten a taste of what this is like. See, for someone to say, I've seen everything you've done and I love you anyway, there's nothing more powerful or life-changing than that. I've been married to Sarah for 19 years. She knows me, knows me better than anyone else on earth. She's seen the worst of me. Like, Sarah doesn't know in a theoretical sense that I'm a selfish person. Sarah has experienced my selfishness. She's been hurt by it. She's been the victim of my selfishness. And when Sarah says, I love you, when she says, I've seen you at your worst and I love you, that kind of love, it goes in deep and it changes me. And that's what we have from our loving father. He's saying, I've seen you. I've seen everything you've done. I've seen you at your worst and I love you. I just want you to come back to me. And that's where it starts. That's where childlike relationship with our loving father starts. It starts with acknowledging that we are completely dependent on him. And as soon, as soon as we go running back, he'll take us. And I can't wait to talk to you about what's going to happen after that. It gets great. Childlike wonder, childlike faith, childlike worship, childlike prayer. It's going to be amazing. You are amazing. Happy Friday. Go in peace and have a great weekend. <laughs>